He loved me, and he loved me enough for me to walk around with bruises on my face. Battle in domestic violence. And the art of Zenobia Bailey, next on Black Nouveau. Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Collis. We're glad you could join us. On this edition, we'll review the art of Zenobia Bailey, sample the goodies of a local popcorn and candy shop, and discuss what age women should start checking themselves for breast cancer. But first, October is National Domestic Violence Prevention Month. Last weekend, the DeCamp Project sponsored a fashion show to raise funds for local shelters and awareness of the problem. Is we're gonna give you a total makeover from head to toe. We have a modeling agency which is gonna come in and teach you a catwalk for the day. We have area designers who've actually donated clothes for us for you to model. Right here at the bottom of the closet, Steve has graciously, we're gonna pick two outfits for you to model in. So again, you ladies gonna have a lot of fun, but it's actually about bringing awareness to domestic violence. I um, was abused um, when I was married. As a child, I didn't really understand. I knew that my mother was hurting. I knew that there were other people, other adults and children feeling the same way that we did, kind of displaced and not knowing what to do. Here at the bottomless closet, women are picking out clothes that will be part of a fashion show put on by the DeCamp Project. These women were chosen because they have overcome nice domestic violence. If it's the right side. I just got out of an abusive relationship for years. My car was set on fire inside of the garage. And like, besides, you know, the fighting, that was enough, you know, for me. Um, me and my children was asked to leave out the home. Um, he was um, put into jail, but they didn't prosecute him because they didn't have enough evidence. I put a restraining order on him. And right now I'm just um, trying to regroup and regain, but I've lost a lot. Well, I found the purple. It looks good, and it looks good on me. But I need a top. Then I have this blue one. It started out where gorgeous. we would conversate from a conversation. And I think we would have a miscommunication on whatever the subject might have been about. And it went from that to, you know, he would hit me upside my head and, you know, stop, don't, you know, put your hands on me. It went from that to later on at night, about time for bed, I go and get in bed and he would come in there, just jump on top of me. You know, and I refuse it. It went from that to a slap here, a slap there. Before I know it, I was waking up with black eyes, busted lips. You know, like, you know, I don't, I don't think that I should have to go through this. But baby, I love you. I love you. So he loved me, and he loved me enough for me to walk around with bruises on my face. We want to tell you each and every one of you guys again publicly that we appreciate. Your, your tenacity and, and your courage to, to even talk about this issue because to me you guys are heroes. I don't have to look far for heroes when we have ladies like yourselves who... Christopher Beverly, the founder and chair of the DeCamp Project, has had his life through, affected by domestic violence. My godmother was murdered at the courthouse and they changed all the laws after the fact. Well, she was in a domestic violence situation and her, her, her predator followed her down to the Milwaukee courthouse and he murdered her. So this is an issue to me that's personal. I'd like to thank you guys. The purpose of the DeCamp Project is to raise funds to give to those resource centers that have been advocating for domestic violence. They also want to impact women and show people that just because you're in a domestic violence situation, you can survive. What I wanted to do with the domestic violence as well is also address the men's side. That was considered to be a woman's issue. But when, my, when I started to do the research, when a man puts his hands on a woman, it's considered to be domestic violence. But when a woman in, uh, does the same thing to a man, it's considered a domestic dispute. I have a problem with that. Because we need to address both sides. We're joined now by Ann Connolly, 
organizational liaison for the DeCamp Project, and Sean Muhammad, Associate Director for Aisha Family Services. Welcome to Black Nouveau. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Connolly, yes. would you define domestic violence? Domestic violence is when um, violence is portrayed against you by an intimate partner. Now, does this specifically refer to women or can it refer to men as, as well? It can refer to men, women, same sex. Mr. Muhammad, yes. still the majority of the domestic violences are committed against women, correct? Absolutely. Why is that? That is absolutely correct. Uh, there are a number of factors that go into that. Um, uh, women, when you look at the statistics, the majority of restraining orders, the majority of domestic cases that are filed in the state of Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee, and nationally come from women. Uh, there are men who do file restraining orders. There are men who do call the police in instances of uh, domestic disputes. However, the overwhelming majority come from women. How bad is the problem in the African American community? I believe that it's still considered taboo. A lot of things, a lot of the issues that take place, women don't report it as much as they should. Men do not report it, and the statistics are a little one-sided sometimes. Why do you think it's still taboo? Because a lot of us are afraid to put our mates in jail. Okay. Um, a lot of the women, we still feel like that we'll be blamed, or people will think that we could have gotten out of it when we couldn't have. So that's why we believe that the resources need to be put out there. We also be believe that dialogue needs to take place so people can understand exactly what domestic abuse is. Okay, um, how is this makeover therapeutic that you will be doing? It's inspirational, it's uplifting, it empowers the women. For instance, when we were at the bottomless closet, the women, some of them came in, they were still down from the situations, even though they've conquered it, they still have inside scars. But this particular day is the day for them. Everything that we do is focused on them. And um, the reason I believe it's therapeutic, because anytime you uplift a queen, she stays on that level. Now you're yeah. talking about that particular day, you're referencing the fashion show. The, right. Tell us more about it. Okay, well, uh, the fashion show, that's coming from uh, the DeCamp Project, which is the brainchild of uh, Christopher Beverly, uh, and Ann Connolly, which is the arms and legs, the, the person who makes everything happen with that. Well, we forged a relationship with them because we, we understand what they're doing, we love what they're doing, and Asha Family Services being in the community servicing uh, uh, women of color who have been afflicted by domestic abuse since 1989, it was only a natural marriage for us to get together and, and hook up to make this happen. Yeah. How did this partnership come about? Well, actually, uh, uh, funny, I actually met Ann and Chris uh, at Sweet Black Coffee. Okay. They were actually promoting another event that they were having, and uh, I actually wasn't able to attend that event. However, I gave them a donation, and we spoke briefly about their event, and I told them what I did with Asha Family Services. Okay. They let me know about a future event that they were having, and I told them I was on board. All right. The rest is history. Okay. Mm -hmm. Explain what kinds of emotional changes victims of domestic violence go through. Biden. Well, okay, you want to answer that? Sure. sure. Well, I would say that uh, when, when you look at emotional abuse and verbal abuse and uh, psychological abuse, there are a number of indicators that you can see. Um, when you see a victim or a woman or anyone who is being isolated from their family, when you see uh, anxiety, um, when you see uh, instances where they may be suicidal, instances where they may uh, be acting other than themselves, those are all indicators that uh, abuse has taken place. Now, Ms. Connolly, to piggyback off of that, mm -hmm. oftentimes can victims also be enablers at the same time? You might call it enabling, but at the point of abuse, you feel hopeless and helpless. You're also afraid of your abuser. So I wouldn't call it enabling. I mean, you're just afraid and you don't know how to get out of the situation. How can people help women they recognize to be in a domestic violence situation? You actually have to talk to them. You have to encourage them. You can't really force anybody to leave because sometimes the dynamics that are at play are very dangerous. Absolutely. But that's, that's what the resources are for, that they need counseling and, and, and encouragement to let them know that you're not doomed in this situation, okay. that there's help for you. Now, you have a great partnership. Now, how did the DeCamp Project come about? DeCamp Project is the brainchild of um, Christopher Beverly. Okay. He's the, actually the founder and chair of the Soul Worldwide. Mm -hmm. 
and DeCamp is the um, humanitarian mm -hmm. department of us. And we believe that if you meet people where they are, you can assist them to the level that they desire to be. So our goal at DeCamp is actually to bring resources together with people and also to assist the community with any type of awareness that's there. So wherever the camp sees a need, mm -hmm. we're going to be there trying to bring awareness to those situations. Now, now, now what other projects does your group fund? Well, before this one, we had a 5K walk in August, and it was to uh, bring awareness to cancers. And we chose five different cancers because those were the ones that actually affect not just our African-American com community, but they're like silent killers. And we had colon, prostate, leukemia, breast, and um, cervical cancer. So just a holistic approach from your oh, organization. Oh, that's right, that's okay. right. In the, in, in the package, uh, Mr. Beverly mentioned how the issue of violence between men and women are looked upon differently. Why is it that if a man is abused, it's not looked at as domestic violence? I think that's extremely important well, to flush out here. That, that's a good question, but um, one of the things that we do at Asha Family Services is we take a holistic approach dealing with domestic abuse. Now, <clears throat> it's one thing when uh, a man is, say, let's say he's harmed, he's hit, he's slapped. Uh, the damage that's done to a man is a lot different than the damage that is done to a woman. Now myself, uh, though I'm the Associate Director at Asha Family Services, I also facilitate batter's treatment groups. And it's not all give and take. It's not the same dynamic that goes into play when you're looking at the male versus the female. Very briefly, are there services available for perpetrators? Of absolutely. Domestic violence? Yes, absolutely. Is. absolutely. And one of the places they can go, absolutely, is Asha Family Services. We provide batters treatment programs, uh, anger management programs, we provide substance abuse programs, and many times when you deal with domestic abuse, you're actually coming in through the back door, you know, because it may be a number of other issues that are in the forefront that exacerbate sure. and cause domestic violence. Finally, if people want more information, how can they go about getting it? They can actually go to the website. Okay. You can look up domestic abuse centers, and there, there's a whole list of them. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to our website, DeSoldeCampProject.org, mm -hmm. and we're going to have a list there of, of services and resources that are available for you. All righty. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, well, thank you so you. much for having us. Thank you for having us. In the American story, artists from far and wide fuse personal identity with cultural heritage. Zenobia Bailey dives into the African-American aesthetic of crochet. Now, with the aesthetic that you learned in school and what you had grown up with, is, that, is this a combination of those works or is this your, um, your idea of the African-American aesthetic? My instructors told me there was no such thing as an African-American aesthetic and I told them there was because that's how I was in art school because I was, um, that, and uh, that's, the aesthetic that I was raised on, because I deal with, a, with the aesthetic of funk, it's really um, based on an emotional um, rhythm pattern kind of development and the color combinations. There's no uh, set um, technique to do it it's, except for the stitching, but as far as the surface design, you know when it works and you know when it doesn't work. When did you start displaying your works or um, this collection? Well, this collection started at the turn of the century. Started during a residency I was in in the Studio Museum of Harlem. Nothing was done as far as that residency was concerned. And I titled that Paradise Under Reconstruction in the Aesthetic of Funk. That was the first stage. From there, I was just working for seven years. It was a seven year project. I was just working on different components, kind of trying to build the whole concept together. I started with the hats. The hats I used myself as the muse. Right. And I started designing hats that would I could wear to the different functions and different things that I go to to develop that lifestyle. The hats take about two weeks to do. The other pieces are um, the mandalas, they're points of concentration for meditation. These are based off of a lot of um, inspirational and spiritual artifacts from different cultures and combining um, the aesthetic of funk to it. Does each one of these pieces, like some of these are just, they look so extremely 
vast and time consuming. How long does it normally take you to do a piece? What I do with each piece is I just do individual circles. Mm -hmm. And I just do like a bunch of different circles, different sizes, and then I'll just all of a sudden st stop and take the largest piece and put it on the wall. And then I'll take another piece and I'll start composing the different pieces. And then after I see that it's where I want it to be, then I start putting the blanket stitch to st stitch them all together. But um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a phase of a lot of crocheting. And the largest pieces take about a month to do, maybe a couple of weeks to a month to do. Mm -hmm. And um, the smaller pieces, I don't even know because I'm just, you know, I never really time them or right. anything. But um, the tent took about six months to do. This tent here took about six, six months to do. And you put, you put the garments for each one of these? Yeah, I made the garments. Yeah. I made everything for them. The faces are made out of terracotta clay. I made a mold for them. And then I painted it over with acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. And then um, I made their dresses. In addition to her artwork, Zenobia has also developed a workshop. The workshop itself is about creativity and community development. And that's what this is. This is a community. And this is a community that's like gypsies on the road, you know. And like what we're doing, we set up camp here. Mm -hmm. And we have the workshops in the artery. And from that workshops, we're trying to stimulate, inspire creativity within the communities wherever we go. And really, it's something that everybody can do right now. Because like every, in every household, it's every, somebody knows how to crochet, somebody knows how to knit, somebody knows how to sew, you know. Okay. So it's just being inspired to do it, you know. But all this, nothing is new. None right. of it is new. It's all about the needle, the imagination, and just taking the time to do it with a heap of yarn and imagination, and your imagination takes you to, you know, New wherever heights. you want, want to go, you know, it's like your, your magic carpet ride. Meet the candy lady, Jackie Chesser, owner of Goody Gourmet's Popcorn and Chocolates. I thought that I wanted to make wedding cakes, and so I ran out of flowers one day, realized I had chocolate, so I stuck the chocolate on the cake. Everybody at this event ranted and raved about the chocolate. So she exited corporate America and started her own business. And like corporate America, she did her homework and research the candy business. What motivated you to make candy as opposed to another kind of product? Besides the fact that I really love to cook, and I don't care what it is, I found that it was the easiest venture to start. And the research that I did, it would have taken me a number of years to just be able to open the door to anything. So we just started small. What we do here is dipping. We don't actually make chocolates per se. We make a lot of the recipes from scratch, and then we just use different products, different chocolate products to dip them in. So we do hand dip chocolates. And how did you decide which chocolate, which shape, which flavor? How, how do you come up with all that? Well, this is a, we kind of did a survey prior to opening to decide what people wanted. And we just took maybe the top 12 things, and that's what we made. What is your specialty? Um, popcorn. We started off with the confections, but that wasn't it. Every, you know, we still do well with the confections, but the biggest thing is the popcorn because everybody loves popcorn. And what about the popcorn they're loving so much? Um, the, I think the fact that we offer the different flavors is what's quite exciting because, for example, nobody's ever heard of like lemonade popcorn or jalapeno or bacon. So when the customers come in, they have the option to try any of the flavors they want. It took me about three years to actually do the planning for the business. I played around with different recipes to make sure that I perfected them, to make sure that the consistency would be there. And then once I decided to open, of course everybody is always giving me something new to try. Well, you can't open without popcorn. So that took another maybe year and a half to research and perfect just to get the consistency there. So after we did that, we found that um, there was no place in the city offering the different flavors of popcorn. 
So we ended up connecting with a couple of flavor specialists and we got together and really added some of the, the flavors to the cheese popcorn that we were doing. And we were quite surprised at the results. So. What's been the reaction from the neighboring businesses and from the community on your venture? They have been quite excited as well as supportive because there's nothing like this in the area. Chester's popcorn has been compared to the Chicago style of popcorn, which can now be bought here, alleviating the long drive. What do you want customers, when they taste your product, what do you want them to think of? I want them to think of something from down home. I want them to know that we really, really care about what we're doing. There's a lot of pride that goes into every batch of popcorn and every batch of chocolate that we make. So, so far we have gotten the very, the very results that we want from the products as well as from the customers. So at any time during the day, stop by Goody Gourmet and visit the Candy Lady. October is also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we've talked about the importance of mammograms in detecting the disease. The prevailing wisdom is that women start getting mammograms at age 40, but 40 is too late for many African American women. Here to discuss that are Dr. Hanadi Buali and Rakia Jones, who recently discovered she had the disease. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. You're Thanks welcome. for having us. Rakia, tell us your story. When did you find out you were diagnosed with breast cancer and what happened after that? Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer May 19th of this year. And how uh, old were you? 35. Um, I remember um, feeling a lump in January and you know I um, didn't think anything of it, um, kind of brushed it off, thought it was, you know, with my monthly cycle. And um, in February, the lump was still there. It had gotten a little bigger. It was very sore. And so I went to a doctor and the doctor said that it was nothing to worry about. And so I went home and my mom said, well, Rakia, um, he didn't order a test or anything. And I said, no, you know, it's nothing to worry about. And she said, well, maybe you need a second opinion. So I went and got a second opinion and um, that doctor put in for an ultrasound and um, they discovered May 19th that it was indeed cancer. Did you find that lump during a self-breast exam? No. Did you, had you had a routine of doing self-breast exams? No. Doctor, how important is self-breast exams? Well, I know the American Cancer Society would tell you that um, they do not uh, recommend for self-breast exam, but this is my philosophy. Get familiar with what your breast looks like and feels like, because you will know if there is anything that is different and that will make you seek medical attention sooner rather than later. So you're not gonna lose anything by getting familiar with how your breast looks and feels. Is the number of women being diagnosed younger? Is that rising, that number? It's not specifically in the younger women. It, there is a general rise in the incidence of breast cancer in both uh, in premenopausal and postmenopausal women. Now, originally people thought that it's because we're doing more screening mammograms and discovering those cancers. But if you look at the history, uh, it should have been, you know, a sudden surge after the implementation of screening guidelines. And then there should have been a plateau of those numbers, but that plateau didn't happen. We still see, uh, you know, a slower, but, but albeit there is still a rise in the incidence of breast cancer. Does race play a factor in breast cancer? Absolutely. Uh, there is more incidence of breast cancer in um, Caucasian women, followed by African Americans, followed by Latinos, Asian Pacifics, and then Native Americans here. However, that being said, the incidence of breast cancer in younger women and more aggressive types of breast cancer are more um, common in African Americans. Um, why is that, and what would be some specific signs? Um. 
uh, initially was thought it's uh, related to socioeconomic status or seeking medical attention late, but when they uh, controlled for those uh, factors, they actually found that no, um, it was independent of that and it's something to do with genetics. Interestingly, they looked at the um, they, they looked at studies from Sub-Saharan Africa, and they, they compared um, breast cancer there and here in the young African-American women, and they found that despite the fact that there are lower uh, incidences of breast cancer in Sub-Saharan uh, women, more young women are affected and it's more of the aggressive type. So there are a lot of similarities. So a lot of the drive is probably genetically, uh, um, you know, it's because of genetics. I've heard this term, uh, I've heard this term, triple breast cancer. What is that? It's actually triple negative. Okay. And um, on the cancer cell or within the cancer cell, there are receptors, little molecules that would require estrogen or other factors like progesterone and there is also another receptor called HER2 new to sit on those receptors and turn them on and the cell will grow out of control and that's basically what cancer is. Cancer is growth out of control. Triple negatives are found more commonly in African American women. Those are uh, typically more aggressive cancers. And what is your recommendation for women uh, young women, what age would you recommend women to get mammograms? Well, I'm sure people have heard this in the media, the new recommendations from the United States Preventive Task Force to uh, probably start screening at the age of 50, not 40. Um, I, as a, a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons, American Society of Breast Disease, and also um, uh, the guidelines for the American Cancer Society and the American uh, College of Radiology, we still recommend screening to start at the age of 40. This is the rationale. Um, since the, the start of screening, uh, we've seen an improvement in survival. Survival rate is up to 98%. We know it works. Um, the new guidelines are based on uh, computer models that were de derived and numbers were pr plugged in. So I, as a breast specialist, as a healthcare provider, am very nervous recommending for something new when I know what was there works and something new that was not specifically based on studies but, but on, project, uh, um, on projections using a computer model. Thank you, ladies, both, for joining us. You're welcome. You're welcome. And that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night.